It's interesting to me that uh, um, when we heard from the Canadian neighbors, our, our neighbors to the north, that they use the same acronyms sometimes that we do, but a little bit different words. So where it, north of the border, it's controlling antibiotic-resistant bacteria. In the U.S., it's combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Maybe that says something about our culture. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time giving uh, some background information to you, a global perspective. Some of these things, of course, you've heard before uh, because there have been several speak speakers already to this point. And um, some of them went by so fast that maybe they didn't get the proper emphasis that they deserve. So I'll talk a little bit about the Global Health Security Agenda and the World Health Assembly and what they're doing, about the national perspective that USDA is a part of, especially as it relates to the documents that were rela released uh, from the White House on September 18th of this year, that being the National Strategy for Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, the PCAST report, and uh, the executive order that President Obama's uh, White House issued. And then I'll move very quickly through those slides and get into the USDA roles and responsibilities and our relationship to the National Action Plan and what we plan to do next. And, and so these first few slides I may go through rather quickly and we'll get to that uh, more important issue of what USDA is doing, at least for this talk. So in uh, June of, of this year, the uh, um, World Health Assembly met, and it was the 67th session. There were 11 uh, action packages that were decided upon as part of the security agenda, and the USA has placed priority on three of those 11 action packages. One is preventing bioterrorism. Another is biosecurity and biosafety. Uh, both from an animal and, and plant and uh, human perspective. And the most important one in terms of how the USA ranked them in, in importance is this issue of antibiotic resistance. Um, the World Health Assembly actually passed a resolution. It's resolution 67.5. The 67 reflects the fact that this was the 67th uh, uh, meeting of this group. And they ask for every country that's part of this 30-country uh, consortium to come forward with an action plan for antimicrobial resistance. And these comprehensive plans actually have these items in them, surveillance, laboratory capacity, international standards for testing for antimicrobial resistance, a plan for conservation of antibiotics within their country, a plan to develop how they're going to develop new antibiotics, what preventive measures will be taken in order to avoid the development of antibiotic resistance. And one of the areas of emphasis that hasn't been talked about much at this meeting is the idea of point of care diagnostics that would help us differentiate when we have sick patients, sick animals, or sick people, whether that's an infection that's being caused by a bacterial agent that could be treated with proper use of antibiotics, or if it's one that doesn't require the use of antibiotics. Those point of care diagnostics are gonna be an important part of reducing the antibiotic usage that is not indicated when, for instance, it's a viral disease uh, causing a sinusitis like we heard from the speaker yesterday. And then in addition to that, we're gonna have yearly reporting from these countries about the progress that they've made, especially over the next five years. So you can see that this is not just an idea that uh, a few countries uh, share. This is a global initiative, it's worldwide. And the World Health Assembly has, has recognized that. Now, the reason that the international standards uh, bullet is, is grayed out a little bit there is because um, the World Health Assembly has asked that these three organizations, FAO, OIE, and the World Health Organization, come together and develop those international standards. And so they'll have a tremendous uh, impact. The work that's ongoing there globally will have an impact on how we determine is the best way for us to conduct laboratory testing, say for instance in this country, so that the results of the monitoring and surveillance that's done are comparable across nations. And we can actually use that data to, to uh, analyze it and draw conclusions that are meaningful. So it is indeed a One Health approach. On this particular issue, these are the countries involved in putting together 
those plans that contain all of those items that I showed you in the last slide that were bulleted. Canada, India, Indonesia, Japan, Norway, Portugal, Thailand, and Yemen are contributing countries. The leading countries, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, those countries and are the ones that are uh, pulling together the group to take a look at this. And it's interesting to note that of all of these countries, the predominant majority of these have already banned the use of antibiotics in feed. Now, the collaborating agencies from the, from the U.S. perspective are these agencies represented with the logos here. And you can see that they're very broad and they include uh, an international aspect with USAID, the Food and Drug Administration, and USDA. You've heard an awful lot about so far. Department of Defense is very much involved in this, CDC and the National Institutes of Health. And it's not limited to these. These are the major ones that are contributing to this effort. I want to back up just a little bit and then and talk about uh, USDA and what we've done so far. And you've heard some reference to this USDA antibiotic resistance workshop that was held in May of 2012. That particular meeting was about pulled together by USDA, ARS, Food and Drug Administration, these are people, the, the agencies that are represented with these logos here. And uh, USDA APHIS, FSIS, and uh, ARS really worked hard to pull together uh, the consumer sectors, the public health sectors, and the ag sectors to take a look at this issue and determine what it is that we would do. And this was before the uh, September 18th date of this year when the executive order, the PCAST report, and uh, uh, the uh, national strategy were released. So uh, what came from that meeting is, is highlighted in the bullets below that first one. One of the things that was brought out as being particularly important was that USDA should, and, and, and all of these agencies, should, should make the effort to examine trends. We should be looking at antibiotic usage, not antibiotic sales data. We should be looking at certain antimicrobial resistant organisms and monitoring whether they continue to exhibit resistance or whether new ones come about as a result of the changes that we make and that we should be developing alternative interventions and strategies both on the medical side and on the animal production side in terms of how we manage animal diseases to reduce the indications where we might want to use antibiotics and prevent infections from occurring. You know, nobody really wants to get an infection from a bad bug, whether it's a resistant organism or not. And so all of the efforts that you can make to reduce the exposure potential and the, and the, uh, the disease from, prevent the disease from occurring reduces antibiotic usage as well. And then in this particular workshop, uh, the ag sector in particular called for economic analyses. Those kinds of uh, analyses that would indicate to the agriculture production sector particularly that if there's changes to policy, if there's changes to antibiotic usage, what is the economic effect of that? Is the cure worse than the disease? And then of course education and outreach, and we're all engaged in that, surveillance, uh, research, stewardship, we've heard an awful lot of all, uh, about all of that, and I'll show you later on how the USDA is going to approach that. So let's talk just for a minute about the report to the President on combating antibiotic resistance. This is a quote directly from that document, and it says that while it is clear that agricultural use of antibiotics can affect human health, what is less clear is its relative contribution to antibiotic resistance in humans compared to inappropriate or overuse in healthcare settings. This uncertainty is largely due to difficulties in tracing precisely the origins and spread of specific resistant microbes and more fundamentally, the transmission and spread of specific resistance genes in microbial communities. It also reflects a gap in our understanding of the complexity of resistance across different species in the environment. I put this in here because I think it's very important for us to realize what it says and that it's important for us in agriculture and in USDA to approach this issue and gather as much information as we can to inform ourselves and others about all of these factors that are involved in antibiotic resistance. Now, the, the other part of this uh, report that I wanted to highlight in terms of its effect on agriculture is it does note the diversity of livestock operations and it does, it does emphasize that in each of those cases, whether it's a poultry production, broiler production within poultry, or turkey production within poultry sector, or it's uh, grow out facilities in the swine sector, all of these things are different and the trends will be different. Antibiotic usage is different, 
and we need accurate information to build good policy. I've said for a long time that uh, good public policy really depends on three things, and one of, the, one of those things is having access to complete and correct information. And, and I really don't think that at this stage of the game we have that, especially not at the uh, sector level where it's important in terms of the diversity of livestock operations that we have. We can't lump all of agriculture together, in other words. The second thing that's important to good public policy is having scientific methodologies that are accepted so that they can be applied. When we get the data that we need, and we have the data, and we're going to analyze the data, we need to be able to analyze that data in a way that's acceptable to the scientific community, that's defensible, and that's so that the conclusions that we arrive with and, and that we disseminate in, in the way of information to everybody are believed in and are based on sound scientific principles. The third thing that's really important, and this sometimes just takes courage, is that we have the ability to challenge the assumptions that are inherent in the, in the issue presentation. I think that a lot of times what we, what we don't do, and, and I've seen this, I think, a little bit in the presentations that we've, that we've had so far, is, is we, we all recognize that antibiotic resistance is a problem. There's no question that antibiotic resistance is a problem. What's the issue? And, and the issue may not be the same as the problem. Is the issue antibiotic usage in agriculture? Is the issue the idea that we treat too many infections in children? Maybe all of those things are issues, but they're all different, and they require a different treatment in terms of the investigative approach that we take and the information that we gather, how we analyze that information and what conclusions we draw from that analysis. The other thing that's important, I think, is to separate the problem from the issues and identify the risks because that risk measure may be completely different than what we would ascribe if all we do is lump the issues together with the problem. And so I think we need to spend some time and some special effort to separate those things. Uh, one of the things that Bill Flynn said yesterday when he was up here from FDA talking about uh, the policy changes that they're making and, and what they anticipate is that um, they would like to be able to assess the impact of those changes. And part of our role as USDA is going to be to do that surveillance and monitoring and, um, monitoring and help uh, provide the data and the analysis of that data to FDA to help them to measure uh, the impact of those policies. Now, here's some uh, words from that PCAST report about animal agriculture, and it says, the extent to which antibiotic resistance in animal agriculture contributes to human infection is not known. And then it goes on and says that the risks to animal health posed by the agricultural use of antibiotics are appropriately a matter of serious concern. And at the same time, it emphasizes that the extent to which this occurs is unknown. It could be that they are a matter of serious concern until we start to monitor and collect data and analyze that data some of the conclusions, as I said, based on the issue presentation and the problem at hand uh, about those risks may be, may be wrong. It may be right. It may be underrepresented. Uh, we, we, we need to gather the information to determine that. So this is the national strategy document that was released at the same time. This is the vision that was elucidated in that document. Um, that we would work domestically and internationally to prevent, detect, and control and uh, illness and death caused by infections related to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. By implementing measures to mitigate emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance, that's one way, and ensuring the continued availability of therapeutics for the treatment. And so this really is directed at the issue of antibiotic and the problem of antibiotic resistance. The strategy itself, and this is the, taken directly from the table of contents, and I think you can read this, and I've highlighted some of the words in red, and these are, this is important to keep in mind as I talk about what USDA will do uh, with this issue. So goal one is to slow the development of resistant bacteria and prevent its spread. We want a national One Health surveillance effort. This means surveillance done in animals and people. We want rapid and innovative diagnostic tests so that we're not overusing antibiotics uh, when they're not indicated. We want basic and applied research and development. And we want international collaboration. These are the actual tenets 
of the national strategy that apply to all government agencies, and I'll show you how those apply in USDA. Um, keep in mind the words in green there, prevention, surveillance, control, research and development, because those are the areas that each of the agencies that are more directly involved in this effort from USDA are going to put their efforts into. And then uh, the CDC has an antibiotic threats uh, appendix to the national strategy, and we heard a little bit about that and the uh, serious and the, and, and the urgent uh, categorization of those disease agents, the uh, goals and objectives and the national targets. Now these are areas that if we look at the next steps for USDA, we haven't begun to yet identify. So we don't have an appendix in the national strategy from an agriculture perspective that identifies the most important disease-causing agents that are resistant to antibacterials that we might use that we would want to monitor from an animal health perspective and, and be able to gather information about those disease agents in particular species or production modalities to be able to give that information back to industry to act upon. And that may be one of the places that we need to start uh, right away. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Taken directly from this national strategy, I pulled out of there some of these goals that are uh, directly related to us and highlighted in blue then in, in terms of that um, uh, exposure in these, in these areas. Those things that we'll talk about that USDA needs to do so in 2.3, it talks about uh, capacity in laboratories. And in fact, this particular issue is highlighted in the national strategy and the document itself says that th there will be at least 20 uh, national animal health laboratory network laboratories or food safety laboratories identified by the end of the first year that will contribute data to a national laboratory database about antibiotic resistance. So that already sets a goal in the strategy for us, especially with for the non-laboratory network to be able to meet. Uh, so laboratory infrastructure is going to be important. We need to be able to identify these agents and test them for antibiotic susceptibility. We want to do that in a way that's standardized, and I already mentioned that that's an effort that's ongoing globally that the WHO and the OIE and the FAO will have a major role in, and we want to be able to standardize according to those standards so that we can share data in this country with other countries around the world. And we want to be able to share and report antibiotic susceptibility data, put that into a centralized repository, and then I highlighted in words, in, in, in red, the words as appropriate, and while maintaining source confidentiality. Those are two big issues for us in agriculture, who will we share the data with, how will they interpret that data, how will they report out that data, and how will we maintain the source confidentiality. Those are major issues for us in USDA, and this is written into the national strategy. The national strategy 2.4 talks about monitoring of antibiotic resistance patterns, surveillance of antibiotic resistance and zoonotic pathogens, and it adds the idea that there are commensal organisms that may be important for us to monitor because those commensals, while they may not cause disease in animals, could be indicators of whether antibiotic resistance is emerging as a result of antibiotic use or not. And they may be the most useful indicators that would tell us the most about how this mechanism of resistance occurs and whether or not it's a risk. So this is important for us to, 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 to recognize, and, it, and again, it's written into the uh, uh, national strategy. There's going to be voluntary monitoring of antibiotic use and resistance and a again at the bottom maintaining producer confidentiality. So this is the section in the national strategy that talks about next steps. In the next six months what's going to occur. I put the, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture in green just to highlight that. Uh, the national action plan is going to be a five-year plan that is going to be uh, built uh, with the Secretaries of Health and Human Services, Defense and Agriculture working together. It is supposed to address the recommendations that were brought forward in the PCAS document, establish clear milestones and metrics for each of us to meet along the way. These activities are going to be coordinated by the National Security Council, which is, of course, very much involved with the global health security agenda that I talked about earlier with WHO and the World Health Assembly and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, 
at the White House. So the White House will be coordinating this through the Office of Science and Technology Policy. We need national targets that we're going to put in place and we need measures to be able to meet those targets. And we're expecting that industry and other non-governmental organizations will play a major role in helping us craft these things. And that's where we're at right now because this came out in September and February 15th is the date by which we're supposed to have this done according to the executive order. So the executive order is the next thing I wanted to talk about on that same day. President Obama released this, combating antibiotic resistant bacteria, set forth the idea that there would be a task force and that this would be led by the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary. We would have a five-year national action plan by February 15th. They've established, are in the process of establishing a President's Advisory Council on this issue. But the key message in this executive order is action, as Alani King said the other day, or implementation. And if you read the bottom of this slide, you'll see the resounding themes that I've already mentioned across the board from the Global Health Security Agenda, from the national strategy, from the executive order now. These things are repeating themselves as we go forward. Surveillance, monitoring, instance of new resistance, trends over time, and, and that sort of thing. Inter international collaboration. These are the USDA agencies involved in the National Action Plan. Uh, all of them have a role. I'm going to go down through them each individually and we'll drill down to what they do. I'll show you what we've done in the past uh, and then emphasize areas of development for the future in order to meet these, these goals. So overall, USDA as a department, as a participant, as a partner in, in meeting this national strategy proposes to obtain and disseminate science-based, actionable, quantitative antibiotic drug use information, not drug sales information, but drug use information, coupled with the development of resistance in food producing animals and be able to relate this to production management practices. What that means is that we have to be intimately familiar with how animals are raised, how animals are managed on the farm, and be able to relate those management practices and the use of antibiotics then to whether resistance is emerging as a, as a problem, as a risk, as an issue in animal agriculture and, and be able to relate that as a risk then to human health as well. It's important to emphasize again that FDA will rely on this information to inform its policy and regulatory decisions and that FDA will be tapping into USDA's extensive network for outreach and education. Now, FDA is the regulatory agency, both on the human and animal side. We know that USDA is not the regulatory agency. We have some regulatory authority in the Food Safety Inspection Service, particularly as it relates to residues. But FDA is the agency that approves and regulates the use of all antibiotics. One of the things that um, we can help with is at least for animals, uh, F, where FDA does collect some sales data, they don't have any information, we don't either, yet, about how, that, how those antibiotics are used. We don't have any information about the exact amounts used in particular sectors, and they don't collect any sales information on some of the smaller amounts of antibiotics that are sold in, in the country already. So we're really trying to augment this data collection process so that we have a better picture of what's actually going on. Now when I went through that uh, table of contents slide and I highlighted those areas in green uh, that were in that table of contents and I said that these were USDA roles, these are those USDA roles. So USDA will be very much involved in surveillance and research development, education extension and outreach and very much involved in these next step plans for developing that five year long term strategy in setting in place these uh, metrics that we're going to use to measure our progress toward, toward our end goal. These agencies whose logos are represented here are the ones that are primarily involved. Um, you'll see that there is the Foreign Agricultural Service uh, down in the corner on the right hand side. And of course, FAS is the part of USDA that maintains our international trade relationships, um, not without the help of, of the other agencies represented here. So we'll go through each of these real quickly individually, um, but first talking more broadly about USDA's antimicrobial resistance uh, activity areas. 
again focusing on surveillance research and development, some limited enforcement at FSIS, education extension and outreach. These are the things that in general we want to try to accomplish, just as I said. So we have these objectives in mind. Um, we want to be able to determine or model the purposes of in, and impacts of antibiotic use in food producing animals. We want to be able to monitor antibiotic drug susceptibilities and monitor for drug use in food animals that are presented at slaughter. Again, that's a mainly FSIS role. We want to be able to identify feasible management practices that producers can adopt that will prevent the need to use antibiotics. And we want to develop new technology applications and, and be able to uh, apply them on the farm. Um, one of the challenges is in modeling uh, these relationships, uh, not having enough observational data to parameterize the model to understand the positive and negative feedback loops, the influence on the models that we might create, and the understanding that emerges from those models to be able to make policy decisions based on, on what they tell us. So APHIS, the, the part of USDA that I'm part of, does the uh, monitoring and surveillance. We collect information about antimicrobial use and biologic, and we collect biological samples on farms. And we evaluate the epidemiologic relationships between farm management, antimicrobial use, and on-farm resistance patterns. That's going to be uh, a primary role for APHIS. And primarily, that role will be filled by the National Animal Health Monitoring System. We've heard this uh, NOMS uh, unit referred to uh, in a lot of the previous presentations, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize about uh, NOMS when I was director at the Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health is that we pursued very vigorously at the time uh, the idea that we would become a SIPSI uh, agency. Uh, the NOMS unit is a SIPSI unit. Uh, that's the Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act. What that means is that if we get approval from the Office of Management and Budget to conduct a survey and we collect information from voluntary participants, that information, that data, is not subject to FOIA. So we can maintain the confidentiality of the individual uh, participants that voluntarily participate in our surveys. And that's important. We're, we did this several years ago, uh, a few years ago anyway, and, it, and it's important that we were able to lay that groundwork and we can move forward now. Um, what we want to do to enhance this project is develop some ongoing longitudinal studies over a longer period of time. NOMS usually does commodity studies every five to seven years. It used to be every two to three years, but because of budget cuts it went longer. We'd like to have uh, these kinds of studies done every year and ongoing for a period of time so that we can actually uh, be able to recognize those trends that we talked about. So we want detailed data, more detailed than it has been in the past in terms of the antibiotic usage, uh, some collection of biological samples, again, looking at these commensals and disease-causing organisms that might be indicators. And we want to be able to collect enough data that we can attempt to model how this, uh, ch these changes occur over time and be able to parameterize those models and, and develop the relationships between them mathematically so that we can uh, project into the future if there were, were ever an opportunity to put a new antibiotic in place, for instance, or another intervention strategy. I already mentioned the uh, National Animal Health Laboratory Network, the NALN, and the data system that links AMR testing across those diagnostic laboratories and the goal that's set in the national strategy to have 20 of these online. So that's a, that's a, a goal for us already set in place by virtue of the fact that it's in the strategy. So we're going to be able to, we're, we hope to be able to do this. And, and help out along the way. APHIS also does online training for veterinary accreditation program. We have a judicious use training module already. We're updating that periodically based on changes that FDA makes, like the changes in guidance 213 uh, that calls for greater, greater veterinary oversight of medically important antimicrobials. And this is the, one of the ways that we reach out and educate veterinarians about their role in working with producers in uh, this very important effort. Um, in terms of intramural and extramural research and development, the two agencies at the top there, USDA NEFA and ARS, are those agencies for us. Uh, there will be research that's called for in this national strategy, uh, microbial ecology, and it's associated with feeding antibiotics at therapeutic, preventative, and, and production levels. Of course, we all know that growth promotion is being phased out. We want to look at those management and feeding practices. We want to be able to 
identify uh, the uh, environmental effects and the transport of that resistance pattern from one place to another, depending on administration. And one of the things that is called for in the national strategy is the, and it's actually built right in there as a, as a, as a measurable goal, is that it calls for us in USDA to, to, to do the sequencing of the microbiome of at least one animal production species uh, by the end of the first year. So ARS is very much involved then in collecting those samples necessary to do that and to be able to uh, sequence that biome completely in one of these production animal species. Um, it hasn't been determined yet as far as I know which one, um, but we're just getting started with that. Now NEFA is the extramural research funding agency and you can see how much uh, since 2008 they've funded in competitive awards. There's several different sources for these awards from within NEFA and there's a $25 million uh, uh, budget line in the president's budget for this year that would be directed uh, toward research in this area. Uh, provided that that budget is approved at some point, uh, it, it, will, it would come. But as you all know, we're in a continuing resolution right now. There isn't any money available it, that, from uh, a budget that appropriation that can be used that way. Um, also, NEFA is the uh, Food Animal Residue Avoidance Database Funding Agency, and that's part of you know, the o overall AMDUCA effort. Uh, this provides information to veterinary practitioners and, well, or, or to anybody that wants to access it about the use of antibiotics in animals and, and how they might be appropriately used in the event uh, that you uh, do how to avoid the, the residue that would be potentially entering our food chain. Um, this is the uh, food safety challenge area that uh, would be making a $6 million uh, investment here. I talked about the $25 million already. Um, you heard a little bit from, uh, I think it was Bill Flynn talking about the NIMBIOS, the National Institute of Math and Biological Synthesis. Uh, that's a national science center that's funded jointly by uh, DHS, NSF, and USDA. The, uh, NEFA is the group within USDA that does this, and, and he already talked about the uh, uh, evaluation, the modeling effort that's going on there to evaluate the uh, policy changes in, within FDA. Um, we want to continue the Get Smart on the Farm uh, effort. Uh, that a few years ago, CDC discontinued that. They wanted to give it to uh, USDA. We talked with CDC about that. Uh, unfortunately, they wanted to give it to us without the funding that goes along with it. And we didn't have funding to be able to do it in our line appropriations. Uh, so uh, we hope that if we can get um, budget appropriated from Congress to be able to do this, that we can reinvigorate that program. And then, of course, the online educational tools that NEFA has. Uh, this is a slide that uh, NEFA asked me to put into this slide, sh slide set. Uh, I, I can't tell you much about this. Uh, there is the reference here. It's a CRIS project, apparently with Gene McLean at Arizona State and Antibiotics and Agrosystems State of the Science for a conference there. I hope that this is a conference that hasn't taken place yet. Again, I don't know much about it. They inserted it uh, for, at the last minute and asked me to mention it. So uh, hopefully it hasn't taken place yet. If it has, uh, you can probably find the, uh, the meet, meeting uh, proceeds online at this uh, website address. Um, the Agriculture Research Service, again, the USDA's intramural research program, these are the areas of research that ARS will engage in, investigating changes in the intestinal microbiome I already mentioned. But all of these uh, other areas, development of alternatives to antibiotics, what happens when you feed probiotics, prebiotics, uh, novel antimi antimicrobials that haven't been developed yet. Uh, this is the area of intramural research from ARS's perspective that they really focus in upon. And, uh, um, one thing to emphasize is that while ionophores may be antibiotics, they're certainly not medically important antibiotics. And when we talk about drug sales, uh, the, the, the ionophores that are sold in this country and used in animal production agriculture are counted into that figure. So we, again, this is another example of where we need to really take a look at different production modalities. Of course, ionophores are not fed to some animal species. And, um, identify whether or not there's a problem there. There's never been a case that I know of reported in the literature where an ionophore has led to resistance problem in any way. 
or uh, in any way uh, contributed to the human health uh, resistance issues that we have now. I, want, I, I stuck this slide in last night. It may be a little bit out of place. Um, one of the things that happened at that May 2012 meeting was that we pulled together the human health sectors, the uh, consumer sectors, and the agriculture sectors. And the consumer sectors and the uh, public health sectors really emphasized that they felt that uh, agriculture needed to uh, really move into an area where they, they had better hygiene. And what was clearly evident from, from that meeting is that uh, those sectors tend to associate production agriculture with poor hygiene. And what I would, what I would like to emphasize here is that um, it really is because of disease control that we have animals in production settings today where economies of scale can be realized. And all in all out management of facility is probably the number one area where it's made a big difference. And of course this is commonplace in, in the poultry rearing sector, in swine production, and more and more common as we look across the board in agriculture. And what it means is that um, you're able to fill a building with all of the, all animals of the same age and genetic character um, that are equally as susceptible, equally as resistant to disease-causing organisms. And you bring them into a facility that's been cleaned and disinfected, uh, cleaned and disinfected between fills. So we bring animals into a, a building and we grow them to a certain phase, we move them out, we move them into a clean facility, one that's been cleaned and disinfected before that building is filled again, it's all cleaned and disinfected and these animals are moved in. So these technologies, when we talk about technologies, we, we tend to think of vaccine development, diagnostic development, the science-based technology development, but in the production setting, farmers think of technologies like phase feeding, split sex feeding, artificial insemination. To introduce new genetic stock into their herds, a lot of farmers do not buy uh, animals to breed with. They buy semen or they collect semen and inseminate. And so these are all practices, production practices that are technologies that are applicable on the farm that control disease, diseases in a production setting. And the more that we can talk about those technologies with the farm, farming community, the more likely they are to understand and adopt those technologies because it's something that they, it gives us some common ground to, to discuss these issues with, with our clients as we're veterinarians in practice. I can remember when I was in dairy practice, when 100 cow, cow dairies were commonplace, that um, as they grew and became larger and larger, some of the production practices that they had in place were, for instance, there might be a single pen that was a calving pen, a sick pen, um, you know, and it, it was used for everything because that's all they needed. Didn't work very well when it was contaminated with all sorts of disease-causing organisms because you were pulling dead calves out in the same pen that newborn calves were expected to spend their first few hours of life in, and you had all kinds of problems with navel ill and joint ill and so forth. And until you, dis you, you were able to convince that farmer that they ought to calve these cows out in some place different than where they delivered the mummified calf that came from a cow that was aborting, you were going to have those problems. Well, as they grew larger and as, as they began to understand these things, then of course we had those separated. And market dynamics certainly are important in driving this forward. So if we can explain to the farming community why these technologies uh, make a difference and what that means to their bottom line, then they're more likely to adopt them too. And that's our job as veterinarians. That's our job to be able to do that. The Economic Research Service I mentioned already, analyzing the impact of various production inputs and market level impacts. Uh, National Ag Statistics Service conducts these surveys along with us. They do collect some information on antimicrobial use. We have encouraged them to do that from an APHIS perspective. Uh, there is an agriculture research management resource management survey that's conducted every year by ERS and NAS with consultation from us. It focuses primarily on farm finances. This is the place where we can look at some of these on-farm technologies and, and, and convince, if you will, based on the information that we gather, uh, the, the production community that they could be adopted to their advantage. And we expect to be able to enhance these surveys and collect more information on antibiotic drug, drug use and related production practices. 
Now, the Food Safety Inspection Service, I already mentioned, they monitor AMR at slaughter and processing. I think that you're probably pretty familiar with that. You can read here about the CEQL content statistically based sampling. Uh, the National Residue Program is, an, is a program that's been in place since 1967. Uh, that tests for, not just for antibiotics, but all chemical contaminants. Uh, it's interesting to hear discussion about uh, uh, meats that are antibiotic free. And, you know, according to what we do in FSIS, all meat is antibiotic free. There should not be any antibiotic residue in any meat that arrives at the meat case, regardless of whether the antibiotics were used in the production setting at some stage or not. And so that's important, and it's an important message to get to the consumer. We want to be able to enhance NARMS, and, and NARMS you've heard about an awful lot. You saw some data presented by the CDC speakers earlier in this conference. Uh, we would like to be able to collect more biological samples at slaughter, culture for multiple bacteria, and be able to relate that then back to those management practices, those technologies that we put in place on the farm. So again, the United States Department of Agriculture is engaged across the board in surveillance, research, development, education, extension, and outreach. And one thing that this slide emphasizes, or that it's intended to emphasize, is that none of this work that we do can be done without the voluntary participation from our, from our uh, 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 partners in the production sector. We need participation from other agencies in the federal government. We need industry participation. We need all of the commodities to be on board with this issue, and we need our academic partners. If we don't have that, then we can't implement any sort of national strategy and plan to contribute in any meaningful way from the USDA. And again, I'll emphasize that one of the main concerns of the uh, producers themselves uh, has been addressed, at least through uh, SIPSI, as much as can be addressed. And then, of course, Title VII is the old uh, provisions in the 2008 Farm Bill that ensure confidentiality for producers uh, when they provide uh, proprietary information. And then again, with the global and international cooperation. So the challenges, probably I could have put funding, 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 funding. Uh, but funding is certainly a challenge. Uh, this is not going to be cheap. You heard Lonnie King talk the other day about the PCAST report. It does have some dollar figures in it. Uh, it recommends that the overall budget uh, for uh, human health sector go from $450 million to $900 million. Uh, we're asking for $25 million in, in, this, pre in this president's budget. Um, you know, it's going to take money. It's going to take money and it's going to take support. It's going to take voluntary participation. Uh, the coordination itself with the various action plans that we've put in place across USDA is going very smoothly. Uh, there is a regulatory process in the U.S. that seems to be working. Uh, you've seen that come from the FDA and uh, uh, Guidance 209 and 213. Uh, it looks like it, my, my sense from this meeting, having attended it in the past, is that the tone has changed. I, I recognize that in this meeting today. Uh, it looks like we've got the opportunity for some good support by producers, veterinarians, commodity groups, and others. And our challenge right now is to develop that five-year action plan. And so based on the executive order, it's important to understand that while we have this framework in USDA with all the things that we do and all the ways that we can contribute and all of the build-out that we would like to see happen, if we get the funding, we still need you all to help us put together the plan. Who will we work with first to be able to come up with some of these answers first and foremost? What sort of data will we collect? How will we use that data? How will we generate information that's useful and of value back to industry and then be able to uh, contribute in the overall sense of, that, of, the, of the issue to the human health sector and do that globally? That's gonna be our, our next big challenge and we're right in the middle of that right now. Um, this is, uh, I'll, I'll end with this uh, quote that I found. Uh, it comes from one of the most uh, preeminent microbiologists of our time. Uh, some of you may have read her work. She, uh, with James Lovelock, developed the, the Gaia theory of Earth as a living organism. She was a microbiologist married to a cos cosmologist. Uh, Lynn Margulis was married to uh, Carl Sagan. And uh, she did a lot of work in the microbiological world. And, and what I like about this is is the way that she talks in the beginning about how our culture resists the true values of the scientific way of knowing, that we disdain observational patience leading to open-minded description. We really need 
to be able to observe what happens on the farm and, and be able to describe that. And we need to be able to describe that in an open-minded way for everybody to understand. And we need to not discourage eclectic methodologies because we don't really know how best to analyze the data that we collect in terms of this very, very complex issue of antimicrobial resistance. And when we detect resistance, we need to be able to determine what the risks are as much as whether or not it's an issue or a problem. Because the problem may be not as great as we think it is if we can identify the risks. And, and we really need to be able to encourage that researchers develop uh, different types of methodologies to be able uh, to do that. And then uh, we dismiss attentive care. That's not to dis diminish, diminish, in my mind, the idea that stewardship is important. Stewardship is incredibly important. And we need attentive care. And we shouldn't use antibiotics when they're not indicated, when they're not needed, and when we don't have to use antibiotics. Because we all agree that the use of antibiotics is what causes resistance to emerge in, anim in, in bacteria. And, or, or to be augmented in bacteria. I, I don't think that any of us question that. And so we need that attentive care no matter what. But if they are indicated, we need to be able to use them, and we need to be able to understand the risks when we use them and the benefits to society. So this is the group in USDA that's working on the uh, action plan right now. These are the people that have been involved here. These are not the only people involved. Uh, these are some of those people that are directly involved that you can contact if you have ideas or, or things that we can do.